This episode of Engineering the Future has been brought to you by the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. NWMO is the national organization responsible for safely managing Canada's used nuclear fuel, a critical component of Canada's long-term sustainable energy strategy. Want to learn more about NWMO's plans for the future? Visit nwmo.ca. This podcast is brought to you by OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, the advocacy body for professional engineers in the engineering community in Ontario. Welcome to Engineering the Future, a podcast brought to you by the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. I am your host, Jerome James. At OSPI, advocacy is our cornerstone, driving us to create change and progress within the engineering community. To fulfill this commitment, we've established five task forces, each focused on conducting research and providing policy recommendations in areas critical to engineers in Ontario. With us today to help shine a spotlight on the work being done by OSPI's Climate Crisis Task Force is Chair of the Task Force, Jeff Shefford, professional engineer and owner of OBK Technology Limited. Jeff. Welcome to Engineering the Future. Jerome, thank you. Delighted to be here. Excellent. Let's just jump right in. Perfect. Please, if you can, give us a brief overview of OSPI's Climate Task Force and what their objectives is. Well, what we're trying to do is to find ways of making sure that the shopping list of initiatives that relate to climate crisis mitigation, adaption, and control and reversal is handled in such a way that we can provide position papers to the provincial government and broader if necessary, and then push the various initiatives that are green. And we'll get into some of those in a few minutes as we talk about the, the particular initiatives. Great. What motivated you to take on the role of chair of the task force? Well, that, that I think is fairly simple. I've already been doing some blogs. Uh, I did two editorials for the OSPI magazine uh, about uh, two years ago, 18 months ago, uh, and did uh, my own series of podcasts. And during the course of that, in meeting up with Sandro and the like, you know, I, I was asked whether or not I might participate in the Climate Crisis Task Force because OSPI was, uh, was reinitiating some of those uh, activities uh, a little over a year ago. So I was motivated to do that because you know, whilst I don't consider myself to be an expert in climate crisis, I'm certainly an avid student of it. Therefore, I know a lot about it. That makes sense. So let's start talking about some of the current challenges when it comes to dealing with the climate crisis. What are some of the most pressing climate-related challenges would, we, would you say uh, Ontario is facing currently within the engineering profession? If I may, I'd like to put it into, into a, a bigger context for a second. If I go back over the last two years, and I do a lot of looking at the data, we are still globally at 420 parts per million of CO2. You know, the ocean uh, pH has dropped by one point, becoming more acidic. The atmospheric temperature is now just a hair above the 2015 climate accord from Paris. And we've got about a one degree Celsius rise in ocean temperatures. All of these things are a disaster and they're not going backwards. However, if I focus in on Ontario, Ontario, if I then compare it to Iceland and some of the Scandinavian countries, Ontario is actually in extremely good shape. So we just want to make sure that everything that we have that is green stays there. Governments don't reverse on decisions. And we'll get into a few of the initiatives because we've been quite instrumental in persuading the provincial government in order to make sure that the activities that relate to climate adaption, mitigation, and general greening stay intact. And if there's some black backsliding, so to speak, then we jump up and down and get involved and get excited about making sure they don't go in the wrong direction. So are you saying that Ontario is, is in a good place from a legislation policy perspective, or are we in a good place from a climate catastrophe situation or climate change perspective? I would say neither, neither is perfect, Jerome, but both are 
in better conditions than many others. If I look at other provinces in Canada, particularly out west, or I look at some other countries around the world, Ontario is really in much better shape, both legislatively, etc. And I like to think that our OSPI task force and the other task forces within OSPI on sustainability and energy, we've all had an impact on that. And so all of those things, I think, have been moving in the right direction. And our task is to identify the opportunities and keep them moving in the right direction. Because politicians, no disrespect intended, politicians are politicians. And if the vote is going in another direction, they'll backslide and some of these initiatives will fall off the table. Oh, that's interesting perspective. So how would you see the impact of climate change affecting communities and infrastructures in Ontario if things were to get worse? And how does engineers come into addressing this challenge? Well, one of the issues I've mentioned in my previous podcast is that everything we have in this world, if it didn't come from Mother Nature, wasn't natural, it's been engineered somehow. So all of the climate crisis things that we are currently dealing with ultimately are the outcome of everything we have created. So our task as engineers is to figure out how to reverse that. From an engineering technology viewpoint, it's not difficult to figure out how to reverse it. What it needs is political leadership and money. So those are the issues. And whether that's in a global context, whether that's in a, a US or a European context or elsewhere in the world, China, for example, or Russia, if it's, I look at Ontario, that's still the requirement. We need to stay on track with greening. It's an interesting uh, perspective uh, and something that you, we need to keep reiterating. Everything that is man-made has been engineered at, and is being introduced into the natural space. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the task force initiatives uh, for a moment. Can you discuss some of the key initiatives and projects that the Climate Change Crisis Task Force is currently working on? Well, maybe I'll just take you through the headings. And if you want to stop me on anyone to ask a question, we can do that. But let me start off by saying I've got a, you know, a very knowledgeable group of volunteers, probably about 15 people involved. And they all put their arms around one or two of these initiatives. For example, uh, developing a, a sustainable grid uh, and the grid infrastructure capacity with resilience and cybersecurity. You know, I have a small group that's taking care of that. And they're in that part of the industry sector, so they know what they're talking about. We're looking at EVs and we're looking at battery technology. And we're not pushing EVs because that already has a momentum, but the battery technology and recycling and recovery of metals from that, that's an important initiative. So we have a couple of our people who are looking at that, leading it. Then we have green hydrogen. I'm a great advocate for green hydrogen, but you know, and green hydrogen is important, but it requires an incredible amount of electricity to be green, as opposed to the gray, the purple, and the others, which all come from variations of, of fossil fuels. But the problem with hydrogen is you can't put hydrogen in passenger cars conveniently because the distribution infrastructure for domestic transport is very complex for hydrogen. But if I'm trying to hydrogen power trains across Canada or long distance trucking, that becomes more viable. It's not a slam dunk. We're not there yet, but it's possible. So if we're looking at that, we were very instrumental from OSPI perspective. Uh, Pickering was not on the radar screen in terms of refurbishing uh, the Pickering uh, 2 uh, units. You know, we were able to persuade the government as part of the persuasion process from OSPI that this is an essential. And lo and behold, we now have that on, on the task list, right? So that's working. We're also working on a number of other things in that area. Darlington, for example, is working on SMRs. I like to think we have been instrumental in supporting the further development. So one of them is in the final planning stages right now. And there are three more anticipated. So, you know, that to me is very important because small-scale, uh, manufacturable, factory-buildable nuclear is important to our northern communities because 97% of our indigenous northern communities run on diesel generators. So we've got to get them off that because that's a big contributor to the, to the fossil problem. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. At OSPI, we're here for you making sure government, media, and the public are listening to the voice of engineers. 
You can learn more at ospi.on.ca. I want to just point something out here. It sounds like the climate crisis task force is very cross-disciplinary. You have a lot, I hear uh, cybersecurity, I hear EVs, I hear uh, energy production, storage. So would you like say that it is a multidisciplinary endeavor? Very much so, because when you think about it, there is no one single solution for the climate crisis, whether it's global or whether it's here in Ontario. You know, we're lucky in Ontario, which is why I speak highly of us, because we have over well over 90% of our power generation here in Ontario is from green sources with, hi with hydroelectric and nuclear being the biggest of them. And we have quite a lot of solar and wind. But, you know, we are we have well over 90% of, of what we have here is already green. We just need to make sure we increase its capacity, increase our ability to distribute it. So. To answer your question, are we multidisciplined? Yeah, because you know, there are so many factors involved in keeping us ahead of the curve. We need to keep our eye on all of them. That's why we're multidisciplined. So you, you spoke about some of these, I guess, legislative or policy wins that the group has been able to accomplish. I would love to hear what you have bubbling on, on the pipeline of next next steps or next wins that you guys are working on. But if you can talk about that with a, a broad outlook on how these collaborations uh, come about, maybe through government agencies or industry partners, how does uh, an idea come to fruition as a policy win through task force? Well, let me touch on a couple of them, uh, because one of them, of course, is critical minerals and the involvement of the indigenous community and the sustainable supply of responsibly produced critical minerals. Now, I like to think with us quietly nudging this process forward, in today's Globe Mail, I read that there is now approval with the indigenous communities and the Ontario government that we're going to start putting a road infrastructure up to the ring of fire. Well, that's a critical piece. We can't start unless I have roads and power up there to be able to mine for critical minerals and do it in concert with the indigenous communities. So there's three elements there that we have been gently pushing. And I like to think we have been part of that persuasion process. Excellent. That would be a really great um, win for the province if that goes ahead. And uh, another win for the climate change task force. Absolutely. But, you know, there, there, there's another aspect that's, that's worth mentioning in that, in that regard. Because ultimately, globally, if we're going to make uh, a sustainable future, we've got to be able to measure the metrics. We have auditing processes in finance, but we don't have good, well-structured audit processes in climate. We have ESG. We have the International Standards Sustainability Board. The federal government is now in, uh, is, is got on board with that. And our task at the moment is to make sure that Ontario doesn't dream up something different, but gets involved in the same thing. Because if this is going to work, we have to have measurable metrics within Ontario, within Canada, across the globe, so people can be held accountable for the improvement deliverables which are so essential to our future. If I don't audit financial things in companies, they go to hell in a handbasket. So I need to find exactly the same mechanisms. So one of our initiatives here, Jerome, which I think is important, we are currently pushing through OSPI and the engineering community. We need to create a set of engineering qualifications where professional engineers can be positioned as the auditors of these processes. That's critical because at the moment we don't actually have a structure like that. So we need those people in place. Well said. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit again to talk about mitigation and adaptation strategies. What strategies is the Climate Crisis Task Force advocating for to mitigate the impacts of climate change and to adapt to a changing climate? Well, I can answer that by saying that the Climate Crisis Task Force itself does not do a lot in that area. However, as the chair of the Climate Crisis Task Force, Sandra, who's the president of OSPI, has given me the mandate to make sure that the Energy Task Force, 
and the Sustainable Cities Task Force actually have their climate elements overviewed by me because the question you're asking really in terms of adaptability and um, uh, moderation, all of those things actually sit within those two task forces and they have their own shopping list of initiatives. And my job is to make sure that those move forward. So as the climate crisis task force needs to put some impetus behind what we're pressing the provincial government to do, then we are equipped with them to join forces to push that forward. And would you say that the task force promotes sustainability and sustainable practices within the projects that uh, you're promoting? Yes, very much. Yeah, very much. Shifting over to policy and advocacy, we touched on it a little bit, but I want to dive into it a little bit more. What policy changes or initiatives is the Climate Crisis Task Force currently advocating for to support climate action in Ontario? Well, I think it's, it's continuing to push the prospective outcomes of the various initiatives that I've just mentioned. We've just had a change in the Ministry of Energy, right? There's a so uh, Todd Smith has now switched with Stephen Lecce. So we're waiting a little while because we need to get in front of Stephen Lecce and make sure that he and we are on the same page about the climate crisis issues. We've also been uh, working with the Green Party. So we try to meet with the, with the provincial governments and the leadership there. Uh, we try to get involved in uh, their particular requirements so to understand their needs. And then if they have particular questions they want us to give them information on or a white paper on or some position papers on, then we roll up our sleeves and get that sort of thing done to help them move the climate initiatives forward. And what kind of outlets or avenues does OSPE engage with policymakers and government officials to influence these policy decisions? Well, it's, it's face-to-face meetings. It's uh, white papers that we issue about particular things, and we listen to what they're talking about and what they're looking to do, and we respond accordingly through uh, communication, through face-to-face, through a variety of initiatives. And Paula and Boyana, under, under um, Sandro's uh, guidance, they do a lot of good work in that area. So we back them up as we deal with the, with the provincial ministers involved. Excellent. and. How can engineers leverage their skills and expertise to develop innovative solutions to combat climate change? Well, you know, that's one of the interesting things about being an engineer. When you graduate, or even if you've graduated and you're looking to make a career change, there is so much activity out there in the green engineering field, a number of which I've mentioned, you know, whether it's SMRs in Darlington, whether you want to work in nuclear, whether you want to work in hydrogen. There are so many avenues, you know, uh, putting EV infrastructure around so charging grids are more universally uh, available throughout the province and the, and the country. You know, all of these things require engineers, and the engineers are there. They just need to say, oh, I think I can make a contribution to that one, roll up their sleeves, use their professional skills, and get involved with the suppliers, the supply chain, uh, and those things that develop and deliver those requirements. So I think, to put it in, in very bluntly, the world is their oyster. Roll up your sleeves, get involved. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And for the future outlook, what are your hopes and goals for the Climate Change Task Force in the coming years? How do you envision the role of engineers in addressing the climate tri- crisis evolving? I can tell you, I certainly would want to make sure that provincial government, because that's our mandate through OSPI, stays focused. Right? We're coming up for an election in, 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 in a couple, within a couple of years, uh, if not earlier. So we need to make sure if there's a change in, in that, that the politicians stay on track. Because when I look at the federal government and some of the mm, opposition party denials about what's going on, we can't afford that sort of thing. We can't afford it provincially. We can't afford it federally. And we can't afford it globally, but it's happening. What always drives this is money. And there's money in fossil fuels. And whilst I'm you know, not too happy about what we're doing, the economic sense of fossil fuels for Ontario and for Canada is critical until we have a totally green infrastructure to replace it. So 
you know, I'm not against fossil fuels, but we really have to work on phasing them out. And OSPI can play a role in aiding the correct path forward through for that transition. Yeah. So if we get change in in in, in uh, provincial government and therefore may get some policy changes in those critical areas, our task will be to try and get them back on the straight and narrow. Wonderful. We've come to the end of our, our exhaustive questioning list. <laughs> Is there anything that you'd like to add in conclusion of, of the podcast? Not really. One of my closing statements often is, you know, there's an awful lot of people sitting on their backside and spectating. And I'm saying, roll up your sleeves, get involved, because spectating won't get us there. Go and get something done. Be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Terrific. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us today and sharing the impactful work that the Climate Crisis Task Force is undertaking. We've learned a lot about how engineers play a crucial role and not just creating sustainable solutions for combating climate change, but influencing government policy to make those solutions a reality. So thanks again for your time today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You've been a delightful host, posing lots of great questions. As always, thank you to our audience. We really appreciate your support. Yes. And whether you're listening to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We love hearing from you. I'm Jerome James. You've been listening to Engineering the Future, and we'll see you next time. From all of us at OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, thanks for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode.